On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the March 29th, 2022 edition of What The Ship, top five stories from the maritime sector. Hi, I'm your host, Sam McCoglano. Welcome to this episode of What The Ship. So, lots to talk about news across the world dealing with the maritime sector. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. And if you can, become a Patreon, help support the page. So let's go ahead and jump in story number one. So story number one is kind of a rehash of a batch of stories that we've covered so far over the past week or so. So I posted this article at G Captain from Ever Given to Ever Forward. It was kind of a brief retrospective of where we've been from ever given to ever forward over the past year, and particularly talking about this channel and how this ch channel has grown and developed over the course of the year, but also the issues of why both ever given and ever forward are essential to understand when we contextualize ocean shipping. Uh, there was a comment by someone I respect greatly, uh, Lars Jensen, who talked about the fact that ever forward really wasn't as important as ever given, and I agree with that. Ever Given shut the Suez Canal for six days, bottled up 12% of the world traffic. However, Ever Forward is reflective of the changing nature of ocean shipping with the introduction of these new Neo Panamax vessels. And speaking of Ever Forward, we had an attempt today to pull her off. And unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. Efforts were made to pull her off and the tugs basically were not able to do it. So all five tugs were in place as we talked about in our previous episodes, and you can link to the previous episodes above here. They haven't been able to get her off. There's supposedly going to be an attempt tomorrow to try to get her off. I'm not exactly sure what they think is going to be different in this attempt, but they're going to give it a try. I think what they need is larger tugs, uh, tugs that can anchor to the bottom and both pull and basically hoist on their anchor and substantially more dredging. The other story that we mentioned earlier this week was the story of P&O ferries. That story has gotten a lot of attention across in Great Britain. Uh, this story out of Reuters, Britain to force ferry operators to pay minimum wage after P&O debacle. Uh, one of the things that they were talking about doing was bringing in Indian crews and paying them just a fraction of the cost of what minimum wage is even in the Great Britain. And so that issue has been resonating quite a bit, especially after P&O ferries took money from the British government during COVID, a major issue that's going on. And then the other add-on of a story is this one over in Splash 24 seven about the Felicity Ace, which sank out in the Atlantic after uh, a catastrophic fire potentially caused by lithium batteries on board, although we're not sure about that. This story is really important because it says this, the crew safely abandoned the ship at the loss of the vessel's cargo, comprising close to 4,000 vehicles, estimated at $330 million in accounting and in, in accounting for anticipated wreck salvage costs. The total damages arising of the casualty are expected to fall just shy of 500 million. And this story talks a lot about the concerns and issues people should have with shipping. I just want to come here to the conclusion. As such, it's important for owners and owner operators to carefully review the allocation of risk in its contracts and ensure any gaps are covered by insurance whenever possible. Owners should also be careful to consider any risk of hazardous cargo ca causing a casualty and negotiate suitable exclusions. I can't say enough. If you're hauling cargo by sea, you need to get the insurance on the on the cargo it is too dangerous for you to get charged general average or salvage costs on top of your cargo you need to make sure you're getting that insurance all the time let's jump on over to story number two story number two addresses the global shipping market and particularly what we're seeing happening across the board due to the supply chain crisis this story from greg miller over at freight waves ship charter rates still spectacular but war could tip the balance. Come down here to the heart of his story. Do container line bosses believe the historic freight boom will end anytime soon? If the ship charter mark is any indication, it sure doesn't look like it. Liner companies continue to pay record high sums to rent container ships for up to five years, even as the Russia-Ukraine war creates a temporary cap. 
The Harpix Index, which measures container ship from charter rates, has held steady its highest levels for the past three years. Alpha Liner recently said that the charter rates are at historic highs and have plateaued after weeks of continuous rise. So one of the things we're seeing right now is trucking rates are starting to come down and plateau, but shipping rates haven't done that yet. And that indicates a lot that we're seeing potential increases again in the amount of cargo coming over, or more importantly, disruptions across the shipping spectrum, which we're going to go into some details and talk about. This second story over on G Captain, U.S. Labor Secretary will watch West Coast Ports contract talks very closely from Bloomberg. Labor Secretary Marty Welch said he'll be closely watching West Coast dock workers con contract talks in coming months and is ready to get involved as needed amid concerns about potential disruptions that could add to the supply chain problems fueling inflation. All right, hang on a second here. I, I got to say something real quick about this. So first off, that story right there. Let let's be clear about a couple of things right here real quick. So be watching West Coast Dock Workers contract strikes in coming months. There's not there, there's two months. It's April and May, and then June it's over. June 30th the contract expires. If they don't have a contract renegotiated by June 30th, the West Coast Dock Workers are going on strike. And so I think the Secretary of Labor Marty Welch is doing more than watching this. At least I hope he's doing more than watching this. This has to be of extreme priority. Everybody needs to be paying attention to this because if this strike happens, it's going to cause a disruption that's well and beyond what we've seen with COVID. And so it needs to be addressed. Beyond that, we have Zentia's state of the market webinar, supply chain uncertainty, COVID lockdown and sanctions. So this is from Barry Parker, uh, Peter Sands, Zentia's container freight analysis extraordinaire referred to shipping as, quote, a constant barrage of risk coming into our everyday lives, unquote, at the onset of Zentia's monthly State of the Market webinar. The March episode featuring guest Dr. Harry Brudman, partner, managing director and chair of the Emerging Markets Practice at Advisory Berkeley Research Group dealt with the impact of sanctions against Russia on global shipping. So this webinar is always a fascinating event. And it's an hour long. It, it, it's, it's just amazing to watch. And basically what they're talking about here is, is basically we have too much uncertainty left in the marketplace. The supply chain, COVID, and the potential uh, sanctions and shutdowns over in China are all fueling this issue. And you see that same thing here in the story, which reuses that same picture again. Hello, again, people, get out there and take pictures. We, we're desperately in need of other pictures of containers and container ships. But this one, Ukraine war and China's COVID lockdowns add the supply chain problems. And this story out of Maritime Executive, I think, caps it the best. The IMF, higher shipping costs will drive inflation through 2022. After a year in which shipping costs worldwide, worldwide skyrocketed in part due to massive volume increases and the impact of the pandemic, researchers from the International Monetary Fund set out to explore how soaring shipping costs are contributing to rise, rising costs and inflation. They concluded that dramatic increases in the shipping costs are having a slow but constant impact contributing to inflation with the impact likely to continue to build through the end of the year. So the state of global shipping is it's a mess still. There's a lot of factors at play here. We're seeing issues in Russia and China, which we're going to look at individually here in a second, but also with supply chain issues. This is creating uncertainty. Uncertainty in shipping means higher costs. Higher costs mean inflation. Let's go to story number three. Story number three is the Russia-Ukraine war still going on into a month now. Had a story about an attack on the port of Berdansk and the targeting of a Russian cargo ship, an alligator class cargo ship. Uh, we initially identified it as one vessel and it wound up being a different vessel, but that, that does ha happen. The Saratov is the vessel we believe was in the port. You'll see the claims here for it to be the Orsk, but we know now it was the Saratov. But one of the interesting things we found out about this, had a great discussion on Twitter, with some really talented naval uh, historians and analysts. This is a picture that came out afterwards that got enhanced quite a bit. And one of the things you see here is a couple of things. So 
Here you see the Saratov right here, this red alligator class with those cranes. That's the Saratov, an alligator class vessel. What became clear later on is we know the two LSTs, the two Rapuches, sailed out from the harbor, one on fire. What we found out was the alligator vessel, which was basically a supply vessel, was actually offloading those two LSTs. One of the LSTs was docked forward of it. Its stern ramp was lowered into the bow doors of the alligator. The other Rapucha was alongside, and the alligator was using its cranes to offload from its forward hull, which makes me also question the whether or not the Ukrainians actually attacked this or if this was an accident. But if it was an attack, which it could be, uh, they probably aimed for the alligator. We know that the alligator was destroyed because we got satellite images that basically show it being destroyed. Here we go, port of Berdansk. That's the vessel right there. She was sunk at the at her moorings. So uh, just a quick follow up on that story from earlier in the week. Other stories coming in here. Splash 24-7, Sam Chambers, no sign shipping is willing to take up Russia's safe corridor offering. There was an attempt to get shipping out of the ports. However, most of the ships are still remaining in port. Russia announced yesterday it was creating a humanitarian corridor for ships to leave Ukrainian waters. The 80-mile-long corridor open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. is located 20 miles southeast of Ilvetsk port. Early indications this morning from marine traffic showed that there are no movements by many foreign ships stranded in Ukrainian waters. Uh, I also think it has to do with mines in the water. This story was an interesting one from Bloomberg. I'm not sure what Bloomberg got from this story, but anyway, they ran this one. Ukraine could resume wheat exports depending on next crop. They're really talking about Ukraine exporting wheat in, in the near future, which is just crazy because of what's going on in the country and the ports. But anyway, I, I thought I reported because I just thought it was a strange report. I should also mention that I had an interesting discussion this week on Twitter with a agricultural historian who is making the argument that even the, that there's a statistic going out there that Russia and, and, and Ukraine are responsible for 25% of the world's wheat export. She made the argument, it's like, no, the number's 0.9%, but she was talking about consumption, not export. And we got in this very interesting discussion about wheat production versus export. And, and my point was shipping. You can have other countries make up for the shortfall in wheat coming from Ukraine and Russia, but if you can't haul it anywhere, it doesn't do you any good. And that's the key issue. And when people are starving, they're not saying there's a shipping problem. They're saying there's a shortage of wheat problem. And I think that's the issue I had with that. Other elements here, why Russia-Ukraine war has not ignited crude tanker rates yet. A month into the war, crude tanker rates still mired near historic lows. It's one of the big conundrums that we don't know why this is happening. Uh, the immediate knee-jerk reaction was disruptions create strength in the market, said Evercore, Evercore ISI analyst John Chappelle. We saw that in 1991. We saw that in 2003. So the thinking was, here we have another geopolitical event. It's going to lead to oil storage and the substitution effect, buyers, fi uh, uh, buyers finding new sources. But it's dangerous following the old model, Chappelle told the American shipper. Every event is different. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're not seeing, we saw a quick spike in oil prices, but they've fallen back down again. And what we're seeing is other elements here too. Russian tankers, for example, went dark on the AIS transponders. About 33 tankers disappeared off tracking. And understand that to turn up your AIS, you just have to unplug it. It's not mandated, it be on. So uh, that's really an issue for IMO and the classification societies. Not exactly clear, Russian oil still isn't getting out into the marketplace. And then this story, Biden and EU energy pact, LNG shipping game, changer or wartime hype. Liquefied natural gas is center stage in rush to wean Europe from Russia's supply. Had a big pledge put out by the United States to fill the European need for LNG. And we had this map showing where all the LNGs are in the world. The US is about to pick up a huge amount of LNG exports. Fortunately, we don't have ships to carry it. So we have to charter vessels and foreign flag vessels to do this. War and shipping uh, stocks, containers, dry bulk product tankers up. Great report by Greg Miller looking at stocks of 
specific companies, Zim, Scorpio, Custom Air, Genco, Eagle Dry Bulk, all talking about how the war and shipping stocks are, are increasing. Again, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is, is so fascinating because of the knockdown effects it has down the supply chain. And the fact that we're not going to be getting grain out of Ukraine, fertilizer, in the Black Sea, all of this means that we may be seeing knockdown effects with shipping costs, with availability of ships, with shortages of key commodities, and of course, the always present inflation. All right, that was story number three. So story four is the one we've been worrying about, and it's back again, COVID. China COVID lockdowns worsen shipping jam, port jams. This is a Bloomberg story from March 24th, where they were talking about the congestion in key Chinese ports of Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And this was due to new COVID lockdowns. And what we saw was this has magnified over time. We got these warnings on March 24th. Also, viewpoint, keep an eye on Shanghai from Lorianne Larocco. And then this story, just a few days later on March 28th, Shanghai to, uh, Shanghai's two-stage COVID lockdown may make getting containers almost impossible. And what we're seeing is lockdowns in Chinese ports. This means that the backlog that we're clearing at the ports of LA and Long Beach down to less than 40 ships now at LA and Long Beach, but we're seeing congestion growing on the East and Gulf Coast. Once this clears, once these ports reopen in China, we're gonna see waves of ships coming over and a tsunami of vessels coming across to inundate our ports. This will be coinciding with those labor negotiations on the West Coast. And the warning that's coming out is from Maersk. Maersk warns Shanghai COVID lockdown will increase shipping costs further. Everything is pointing for shipping rates to stay high. The chances of them returning to pre-COVID levels are almost non-existent right now. Everybody's talking about this issue, and it's just not going to go away. And again, what we're seeing are just a numerous number of black swan events. I have no idea how many of these black swans are in this flock, but man, we need to get the flock out of here because we keep having them like every other week. And it just creates this downturn in the shipping industry. All right, four stories, a lot there. Let's go to story number five, because this is the story I want to talk about today. Always choose a story I like. So let's go to story five. All right. This story, uh, History of American Maritime Law, was a sponsored article at G Captain. Uh, it was done by a law firm, uh, specifically Arnold and Aiken. Uh, They did this. But I, I got to say, I enjoyed this article a lot because uh, one of the things is the historian in me. I love the history. I love American maritime history. And so the idea of a history of American maritime law really struck me as an interesting one. And this goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans and the Egyptians and fast forward this up into the history of the United States. As a young nation, the U.S. adopted much of its maritime law from England. The first maritime laws were brought to the America in the 1600s with the establishment of vice admiralty courts at major seaports. It wasn't until the Judiciary Act of 1789, after the American Revolution, that federal district courts were granted jurisdiction over maritime law cases with a serving clause that allowed state courts to hear certain cases. And then it goes into an issue about maintenance and cure, uh, which is basically uh, uh, dealing with who gets to hear cases and then resolve those cases. It talks a little bit here about the Jones Act and the key elements of the Jones Act, talks about the doctrine of seaworthiness to make sure that a ship is able to sail. That's the responsibility of the owner to ensure that. And then when maritime employers hide behind archaic laws, the uh, liability laws, which were some of the first in American history dealt with shipping and then protecting Americans' rights. This goes all the way back to the La Follette Seaman Act of 1915 into the Jones Act. And then they wrap up here talking about some key maritime disasters, the Deepwater Horizon explosion and the loss of El Faro. Just a fun article to read, I thought. It, it, it really touched on some key aspects of American maritime law. So a lot this week going on, not going to lie, been really eaten up by those three topics I talked about there with the ever forward 
the war in Russia, Ukraine, and the continuing issue with the global supply chain crisis. Unknown where everything's going to roll. Every week I come in here not thinking I'm going to have enough stories to talk about, and I wind up with more than I could ever want. So I hope you enjoyed this week's What the Ship. Uh, if you did, please subscribe, hit the bell so be alerted about new videos when they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, become a member of our Patreon page. When you become a member of our Patreon page, you help support our YouTube channel and what we bring to you, the audience. So once again, I want to thank you for tuning in. And until our next episode, Sal, signing off. <laughs>